Okay, welcome to the November 19, 2020 meeting of the Walnut Creek Transportation Commission. This meeting is being held in accordance with the Front Act as currently in effect under the State Emergency Services Act. The governor's emergency declaration related to COVID-19 and the uh, and the uh, excuse me, and the governor's order N 2920 issued on March 20th, 2020, that allowed attendance by members of the commission, city staff, and public to participate and conduct the meeting by video conference. Video conference locations are not open to the public. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek Transportation Commission meeting or their first teleconference meeting, I want to welcome everyone and talk briefly about the public comment process. To provide a live remote comment, join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID is 923-3890-3004, and the password is 304833. When I open the public comment period, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you are connected by phone, which will alert the staff that you have a public comment and you would like to provide. Please wait your turn. The moment brought in the meeting, we would appreciate if you would please state your name as city of residence for the record. Consistent with the city's public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make their remarks. Do you choose not to provide comments or would like to view the meeting? You may do so in each of the following ways. YouTube Live, visit the Walnut Creek YouTube channel, cable broadcast, Comcast Channel 28, Incorporated Walnut Creek, Rossmore Channel 26, Wave Channel 29, and ATD's UVerse Channel 99. Finally, live stream, live stream online on the city's website. Um, will the secretary please roll, call the roll? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I gave you the wrong meeting number. This is completely my fault. Uh, if I may uh, issue a correction here, the meet the webinar ID, the Zoom ID for this meeting is nine two eight six 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 seven two seven. Two nine, and the passcode is five two nine four nine eight. I apologize for that. I was giving you July's meeting number. <laughs> uh, <laughs> on to roll call. <laughs> uh, let's see here, uh, Commissioner Cagle. Present. Uh, Commissioner Ash. Present. Commissioner Salcido. Present. Vice Chair Milks. Present. And Chair German. Here, you're all here, present and accounted for. Okay, time for public communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comment on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the commission cannot act on items raised during public communication, communication but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. Request clarification or refer to items to staff. Does any member of the public wish to comment on an item not on the agenda? Please use the raise hand feature or press star nine to your hand by, by audio only if you would like to provide a public comment. At this time, I will ask the secretary if there are any members of the public to comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are none. Uh, next on the agenda is Commission Considerations. At this time, I invite staff to provide their first presentation. It's item 5A. Actually, uh, Mr. Chair, actually, there's first the approval of the minutes, item 3A. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, next on the agenda is adoption of the July 16, 2020 minutes. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the adoption of the minutes? Please use the raise hand feature or star nine, press star nine if you're taken by audio. If you would like to provide a public comment. Finally, at this time, I will ask Secretary if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Uh, we have none, sir.
Can I motion to move the minutes? Yes. Do we have a second? Second. Is that second, Danny? Yes, I second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think the motion has passed. Yes, the motion uh, appears that the motion carried unanimously. Now, commission considerations. Um, next on the agenda is an item for commission consideration. And the first one is 5A, and it is setting speed limits, a presentation reporting how speed limits are set on city streets. All right, thanks, Commissioner German. Um, Smidar Boardman, traffic engineer for the city. Uh, today, I'll be giving a presentation on setting speed limits. I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Ah, uh, could I get screen sharing ability? <laughs> All right. Just a second. <laughs> I got it. All right, can you all see that? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, setting speed limits. Um, I am going to decode the process of setting posted speed limits for streets. Um, we'll walk through it. It's kind of a lengthy presentation, but I wanted to get into the nitty gritty so that uh, we could really, um, I just really wanted to get across the, the process um, and make this available uh, publicly. So we'll talk about kind of the regulatory setting this evening, um, how to set the speed, the question of the chicken and the egg, and we'll get into that, and then looking into the future. So California has a basic speed law. It's in the California Vehicle Code. Um, no person shall drive a vehicle upon a highway at a speed greater than is reasonable or prudent, having due regard for weather, visibility, the traffic on, and the surface and width of the highway. Um, and by the way, highway is a term that uh, really applies to all streets. So don't mind the term highway. Uh, and in no event at a speed which endangers the safety of persons or property. So there's two different types of speeds. We have statutory speed. So these are actual speed limits that are contained. These numbers are contained in the California Vehicle Code. So we have 55 miles per hour. That's a two lane undivided highway. Um, you can establish a two lane undivided highway as 55 miles per hour and assume that number. Um, we don't have any of these types of streets in Walnut Creek. Uh, 25 miles per hour should sound familiar. Um, and you'll note those asterisks here for residential. Uh, type of streets, uh, business districts, school zones, around playgrounds, and then around senior facilities, and then 15 miles per hour for alleys. So then non-statutory speeds are speed limits that just are not contained within the vehicle code at all. So anything that isn't 15, 25, or 55. And those speed limits are established by doing something called an engineering and traffic survey. It's also called a speed survey. So here's the flow chart for how you set the speed. Um, and we'll go through these, but basically you can see that we'll, we kind of start at, okay, well, is this a local street? Um, does it meet certain requirements? What are the land uses surrounding it? And then do we need to conduct a, a survey or not? So is the road shown as a local street on a, on a California road system map? So this is the California highway. It's part of the national highway system, but specifically in California, this is a little map of Walnut Creek. You can see these little lines, um, the colored ones are representing different functional classifications for roadways in the city. We have a general plan. Um, that general plan defines functional classifications for roadways. They're often called, you know, something like an arterial collector. Those names might sound familiar to you or local streets. Um, the California roads uh, system map is a little different, so it may not be one for one what's shown in our general plan versus what's in this map. Um, but that's what we have to use from Caltrans for setting speed limits. And so all these lines are anything but the local streets. So you can see that a majority of streets in the US, in California, in Walnut Creek are actually local streets. 
So then you say, yeah, okay, we're looking at a local street um, and now you have to ask the question, well, does it meet this criteria that's written out in this code, California Vehicle Code 4802, which is the, the speed trap uh, code. So this is where speed trap is defined. I know that Waze might say, or Google Maps might say that there's a speed trap ahead, but this is a different type of speed trap. This is when you can actually enforce speed when uh, a police department or those who have jurisdiction over a street can in fact enforce a speed um, and what, what speed you're driving at. Um, so it has information in there requirements like the age of a speed survey, um, the certification requirements for being able to use a radar gun. Um, and then it also defines what a residential street is. Um, it has very specific information. So uh, can only be up to 40 feet wide, the uninterrupted length, which is that length of, of street where you don't have any stop signs or traffic signals. Um, it, it's up to a half mile in length. And then it should only be in one, one lane in each direction. And then it also defines what a school zone is or a senior center. And there's additional information in the California Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices that really lays that out as well. Okay, so let's say that we ended up with a street. We have a local street per the CRS, our road system map, and it is 40 feet wide, or let's say it's 32 feet wide, and it's 2,000 feet long, Then, um, and it's one lane each, in each direction, then yeah, we could say that that is in fact a residential street, and then we could post it at 25 mile per hour as the prima facie speed limit. So we can just assume it is in fact a residential street, it's defined um, and it meets that requirement. And so you could put up a speed limit sign if you want to, but it's not necessary because it's implied. That's part of, you know, when you went to the DMV and took your test, um, you usually think, okay, residential streets are 25 miles per hour. But again, they have to meet this certain, uh, these certain requirements, right? And so in addition, again, business districts, you've got, um, you've got the type of land use along it. So a retail commercial, um, we define our business districts. And so that's how we're able to determine if it's appropriate to do a 25 mile per hour um, zone. Uh, school zones, which I've actually done a little asterisk on, um, we are allowed to drop our school zones down to 20 miles per hour. That's something that was recently um, established in the California Vehicle Code, maybe in the last two or three years. Um, and we do already use that in our school zones, but it's only enforceable during uh, school, when school is in session and when, when children are present. And then again, um, around playgrounds or senior facilities. And with this, again, we don't need any kind of speed survey done. We just know that it's met all the requirements per the California Vehicle Code and PD could enforce by radar. All right, so let's say that you're not dealing with a local street that met all those requirements uh, that we just talked about. Okay, so now you need to move into either, you say, okay, it's 55 miles per hour for a two lane undivided highway. Again, not applicable for any streets in Walnut Creek, or you need to conduct an engineering traffic survey. So these are the factors that are used for preparing these engineering traffic surveys. So you collect the prevailing speed of traffic, you get the information on adjacent land uses, um, collect some information on pedestrian and bicycle activity, if there's a lot of activity or very little, um, roadside conditions, maybe there's a ditch to the side of the road, and then crash history, just looking at uh, the, the prevalence of, of collisions in, on that segment. And this is a very defined procedure. The procedure is defined in the California METCD. So for these, first you get some speed data. You collect the speed data, you use a radar gun, the radar speed gun that a PD would normally use to maybe catch you for speeding. And that's how you collect the speeds of a certain number of vehicles. It has to be during a certain time of day. You want free flow conditions, right? You, you want to see what you could be going um, or what, what speed could be done or could be driven at during non-congested periods. So you would never collect speeds uh, during, let's say, the commute time home. Um, and then you figure out what the prevailing speed is. So that's 85% 
what is the speed that 85% of vehicles are traveling at? And then you round. And so either, let's say it's uh, the prevailing speed was 32 miles per hour, you round down to 30 miles per hour. And then otherwise, let's say it's 33 miles per hour, you round up to 35. Uh, and then you adjust. And so they're based on those factors we talked about before, you can round down, um, but there's a maximum and it's established again by this California vehicle code. It's very prescriptive. And so let's say you ended up getting a prevailing speed of 33 miles per hour on a roadway segment. You round it up to 35 miles per hour. And now let's say, well, there's prevalence of collisions and there's a bunch of pedestrians nearby we're gonna go ahead and round down using engineering judgment. And now we can post a speed limit that's enforceable at 30 miles per hour. So now let's talk about the paradox here, right? So design dictates your comfort as a driver. The prevailing speed is that main, that main piece of data that we have to use to establish these speeds, uh, the posted speed limits. Um, we talked about, we just talked about the rounding abilities, what you can actually do, and it's, it's very limited. So we can't just come up with a, yes, we think that this street should be 25 miles per hour, so we'll just post it at that. Um, we're not allowed to do that. Um, it would not be enforceable by anybody, by PD. So part of the design elements for a street and what you feel comfortable driving at include, you know, the width of the street, um, are the lanes very wide? Um, are there a lot of access points? Do you have driveways nearby or is there a lot of on-street parking or bicycles or pedestrian activity? Um, or just even the horizontal and vertical curves of, of the roadway itself. The types of curves that we have in our, on our city streets are very different and much tighter than what you see on, let's say 24 or 680 or any other freeway. So drivers, so here's the deal though, drivers feel comfortable going faster now. And that's because vehicles are just made more efficiently and nicer and more comfortable. And so you don't feel that speed that you're driving at. And so as a result, more, more people tend to speed. And then you conduct a speed survey and then you find out that the prevailing speed is higher than what you really intended to go to um, on a city street. So again, posted speed of inevitably then has to go up because you've conducted this speed survey. So how do we resolve this? And so that's where we get into, you know, re-educating, reinforcing, and, and just re-engineering streets. Um, and Jason will talk to you a little more in the next presentation about our neighborhood streets program. But um, the key here is that if you want to get a, a lower posted speed limit, you need to actually get people to also drive that lower speed limit. And there's uh, several different tactics that you can take to, to accomplish that. So looking to the future, um, the whole, there's a movement called Vision Zero. It's very focused on traffic safety. The idea is that you wanna reduce uh, severe injury and fatal collisions to zero. Um, part, of, part of that kind of work, um, there was an assembly bill for California that was passed in 2018. And that actually only, all it did was establish a task force to just kind of revisit how we do speed zoning, how we establish speed limits, that whole engineering and traffic survey process that we just went through. Um, and there was a report that was published uh, with the findings of the, of the task force uh, back earlier this year. And those recommendations have not been implemented yet. So the existing process isn't changed, it has not changed. So the, the process that we just talked through is, still in place. Um, and honestly, probably based on timelines, you know, I wouldn't expect that anything would change in terms of how speed limits are set in the next, at least for the next three years, maybe five years, but maybe it would be sooner. So also just so you know, we do have fresh speed surveys uh, that we have conducted. Uh, they were, the data was actually collected back in October, November of 2019. And we're bringing that to council um, 
on December 15th for, for approval. And so we'll have some new speed limits around the, around the city. So I will now take your questions or comments. Thank you, Samara. Um, any of the commissioners have questions? Danny? No questions. Samantha, you look good. I think you have a question. Those changes you just said that are coming, are they raising the speed limit on some streets? Are they lowering it? Just kind of curious. And then I, I don't know if. I don't believe a study now, but I'm just curious is the general sense people are going faster now because there's less people on the road in COVID. So I guess those are two separate questions. Sure. So the first, the answer to your first question is uh, the speed limits are either remaining unchanged or there's a few segments that have reduced. We've reduced down by five miles per hour. Um, and then in regards to your second question, Yes, industry-wide, there is a general acceptance that speeding has increased during COVID. Um, you know, it's actually really a shame because in theory, we have a lot more capacity on the roadways. People aren't, you know, doing their commute trips. Um, so it's just, this is, it's a behavioral issue, but at the same time, you know, when you look at the design of, of our streets or really just, and this is all of California, just to be clear, um, it, it is just, there is a tendency for people to do this. And so it, I would love for people to stop speeding on the streets. That would make my job a lot easier and it would be a huge traffic safety benefit, but certainly there has been a prevalence of speeding, uh, during COVID. And are we, okay. are we looking? into any um like uh things like road diets or um other design features to on roads that we know are plagued by speeders yeah definitely so we do have our i guess the the usual suspects as i like to say um for for certain streets we get a lot of resident requests related to them or just generally um you know pd might know that that's kind of a hot spot um the idea here is that as we're moving forward with any repaving projects we've been making an effort to reduce travel lane widths um any kind of implementation of a of a physical barrier to narrow down the lanes also is it helps substantially so that's where something like a separated bikeway that has like a, a vertical element really helps um, one of the nice things that we've been doing with part of the rebound program is that we've actually implemented some traffic calming measures and that's intended to slow speeds down. So in the downtown, we actually narrowed down the travel lanes to 10 feet. Um, and so that, and then again, so just really intentionally with the design, trying to get people to slow down. So it is something that um, our engineering staff is, is looking at as we have projects go through. Um, and then, you know, actually, we'll talk about a few other projects that are going on when I bring the TIF update um, to you later as a later item. But again, part of that work is a lot of a lot of the most recent work that we've done. Um, generally speaking, North Downtown Specific Plan, West Downtown Specific Plan, any of the other planning transportation planning documents really point to um, traffic calming improvements that help with that directly. Samantha, finally. I don't, I don't have any further questions. Actually, I had a similar question to Jared's um, and thank you for the information. Appreciate it. So I have just sort of a, a question, but it's, uh, well, one of your first slides was the types of streets uh, in the street lines. Well, what do you consider the Angel Valley Boulevard to be? Because it was really intended to be a freeway. <laughs> Yeah, Ignatia Valley Road is a major arterial. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's got the freeway feel to it though. Um, yeah. But there, there are certain um, aspects to that street, like the type of access. So a freeway itself has a different type of access. You have those on-ramp and off-ramps um, as opposed to just intersections, uh, normal 90 degree type intersections. So there's a, there's a difference between those types of facilities. 
Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. Um, does any member of the public wish to provide public comment at this time? Please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you are getting right audio only. If you'd like to provide public comment. At this time, I will ask the secretary if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Uh, yes, actually, Mr. Chair, we do have one um, sp uh, speaker, uh, uh, Gary Pete. And uh, we should be bringing them in now. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, Chairman German, it's really hard to understand you. Um, I don't know if you've had a mic check, but maybe that'd be a good thing to do before you have these meetings. Um, second of all, I, I'd like to ask about the, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask about how you come to grips with a, a situation like a, we have here on Wigget. Uh, my name is Gary Pete. I am from Walnut Creek. I live off just off of Wigget. And there's a, it's 30 miles an hour going down Wigget, which is a residential area heading into a 20 mile an hour zone in front of the school. And that's a constant problem. People, people are always going 40 miles an hour. You can stand by the radar screen there and watch the speed as they go along. Um, that seems to me something that would be completely conditional on the situation there. It's residential, there are driveways. Um, it, it needs to be toned down. How do we get that done? Sure, and I'm, I'm actually happy to answer this question. So Wigget is one of those examples that because of the way the California Vehicle Code is written, it doesn't qualify as that quote unquote residential street that should just be posted at 25 miles per hour. And it's because of the length of, of the roadway. Um, that's one of those scenarios where, you know, we would really want to implement some kind of traffic calming elements in order to force the prevailing speed to come down to, let's say, 25 miles per hour, and then we can post the speed appropriately. But we do need an engineering and traffic survey to support that speed limit. So we can't just simply change the speed, the sign, the sign on the speed uh, for, for the posted speed limit. We have to do that engineering traffic survey and use data to, to back it up just because of the process that is in place through the California Vehicle Code. Uh, Mr. Chair, but. Okay, so we move to the next item. Uh, are there any more other speakers? We have no more speakers. Okay, so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so then if uh, you may wish to uh, elicit if there's any comments from the commission, otherwise we're ready to move to the next item. Does any of the commissioners have any comments? Okay, our next item is item 5B, the Neighborhood Streets Program Update. An update on the Neighborhood Streets Program, which seeks to address requests for traffic calming on residential streets. Is there a oh. staff? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Um, I am Jason Pusos, an Assistant Traffic Engineer for the City of Walnut Creek, and I'll be giving you an update. Let me just share my screen. Andy, can I get uh, Sheen? We're on it right now, actually. <laughs> got it, thank you. Sorry. Okay, you've got uh, access now. All right. <laughs> okay, so I'll be giving an update on the neighborhood streets program. I'll start with a quick overview. This initiative was created in response to traffic calming requests that we would receive from residents throughout the city. The goal of this program is to create low cost and quick measures that the local residents can engage and participate in to help mitigate traffic related issues in their neighborhoods. This was initially presented to the Transportation Commission earlier this year in January. Since then, we've had meetings with residents from 
Lavender Drive and Rancho San Miguel areas. And now even through the shelter in place orders, we are continuing with neighborhood meetings digitally through Zoom. Most recently, we met with residents from Second Avenue area and currently working out to schedule with residents from the Homestead Avenue, hopefully late next month. I'll also go over what we've deployed so far, an update on server results and measures still in our toolbox. Lastly, we'll go over the next steps for neighborhood streets. So these photos are from earlier this year in February, 2020, where traffic engineering staff and officer Mangini with Walnut Creek PD met with over a dozen residents of Lavender Drive. We, we were able to discuss traffic related issues that affected their quality of life. And we were able to identify some action items to address their concerns, including spot enforcement by PD and traffic sign modifications. Overall, the meeting was productive and much appreciated by the residents. So uh, our most popular measure for this program is the lawn signs. The city procures the signs and we loan them to neighborhoods. We give the signs to a point of contact and ask them to pass them on to their neighbors or residents can request them through the city of Walnut Creek website. We've created multiple designs such as keep kids safe, 20 is plenty, as you can see in these pictures here. Um, also that we've deployed in the Walnut Avenue and other areas. We also have signs that say, look out for each other, slow down, and all intersections are crosswalks. We limit one sign per household, but we do encourage neighbors to swap and move the signs around as changes in scenery have a more significant chance of catching driver's attention. We also developed a pace car program, which allows residents to lead by example. To be a pace car, a resident has to fill out the pledge card, as you see here. Um, and they would be pledging to drive the speed limit, share the road with bicyclists, etc. And in return, the city will send them the decal shown here on the right that they will place on their vehicle. And then they would be a pace car and help set the speed while driving through the neighborhood. Currently, um, we do not have any volunteers for this program, but it is still presented to residents during neighborhood meetings. And the pledge card is also available on the city of Walnut Creek website. When we started Neighborhood Streets, we created a Google survey to gauge the public's interests of this program. This survey went out to the members of the public who have already sent in traffic calming requests to us and also to some local HOAs. Back in January, we had 90 responses and now we're over 250. And overall, this program gets positive feedback from the residents. Over 80% of them are willing to meet and engage in discussions. Also about 40% of the residents would be willing to act as a champion to help coordinate between the city and their neighborhood. So what are the next steps for neighborhood streets? Um, currently, we've been focusing on issues that we can try to resolve with education and enforcement, but there are some issues that require more resources and engineering. We are looking to leverage TIF monies to implement quick build improvements for traffic calming, which Smidar will actually uh, be presenting during the next agenda item tonight. Um, and then this is just a QR code that brings you to our survey. And that concludes my presentation. I'm open for comments or questions. Thank you very much. Um, do any of the commissioners have questions? Well, again, thank you very much for the presentation. No, there you go. Um, for the for the signs that you mentioned are so they're they're kind of loaned to residents for a period of time and then they're returned back to the city or how does that work? Uh, so this is a pilot program. So right now, yet the city procures them and then we loan them out to the neighbors or residents. Um, they're 
pretty cheap, about three to four dollars each for each side. And I don't have the exact number that we loaned out now, but we have up to a hundred that we can give out for now. And does it does it actually yield a change in behavior? Studies have shown, um, and there's other cities that have implemented this. I believe El Cerrito is a city that has done it. Um, and it does as drivers, when they see something new, it catches their attention and they're gonna be a little more cautious. And that's why we kind of recommend them, some neighbors, you can move the signs or you can swap with your neighbors because as things change, drivers are gonna, they're gonna notice it and they slow down, so. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, does any member of the public wish to provide public comment at this time? Please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. If you would like to provide a public comment. At this time, I will ask the secretary if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Uh, there are no uh, uh, commenters, uh, Mr. Chair. And our last item is the 5C, the traffic impact fee, um, the project, that, what? Oh, Mr. Chair, I was just gonna uh, ask, you may wish to ask the uh, commissioners if they have any comments uh, on, okay. that, uh, on that item. Okay, before I move to 5C, does, it, does any of the commissioners have comments? No. Now right. I just feel bad for interrupting you. It's all right. <laughs> I'll try to make my voice work. Okay, 5C, the traffic impact fees, project less refresh. Recent changes to state law related to CEQA, new and modified grant funding opportunities and recently adopted city holidays have resulted in a refresh to, uh, have resulted in a need to refresh the city project list. In advance of fiscal year 2022-23, capital budget and 2022 to 2032 capital investment program updates. Staff like to report. Thank you. All right. Good evening, commissioners. Again, Smidar Boardman, traffic engineer. I will share my screen. Hopefully, you can all see that. And, okay. Uh, okay, so traffic impact fee, just a little project list refresh. I've been calling it the TIF light update. Um, so what is the TIF? Uh, the TIF is a, a traffic impact fee. Um, it's a development impact fee that's collected when developers come in and build something new. It's just one of the fees that is collected and it is a dedicated source of funds that we can then use for transportation projects. Um, the project list is currently uh, was was per, put together uh, back in and approved back in 2016, um, and it just identifies again transportation improvements that are citywide. So why update the list? So we we've had you know the whole VMT thing that we've been talking about the last few sessions. Uh, City Council did adopt some new local guidelines and significance thresholds for um, for traffic impacts according to the California Environmental Quality Act. So that's kind of a new change. Um, we also have some new grant funding opportunities um, and I'll go into that uh, more specifically a little later on in the in the presentation. And then just some recently adopted city policies, the rethinking mobility plan was approved by council um, about a month ago. And so, it's, it would be nice to be able to go ahead and start implementing some of those strategies, especially since that plan is a little more short term than some of the transportation projects we usually talk about uh, in our capital investment program. And then just also again in preparation for the fiscal year 22-23 capital budget and the 22-32 CIP updates that will be coming to you likely at the next meeting in January just for you to start taking a look at it. So here's, we're gonna start with some modified projects. Uh, these are existing projects on that TIF list. Um, and what, what I'm trying to do here is 
rather than, so we'll, well, we'll go through it. So these are three specific projects, uh, number 58, 57, and eight. Um, they call for expanding or extending left turn lanes at certain intersections along Ignacio Valley Road. Um, so it is the Ignacio Valley Road left turn lane that would be extended and then and provide additional capacity for people trying to make left turns onto those three streets. Um, so with the new CEQA requirements, the focus on traffic congestion has really been pulled back. And while we do still have general plan policies that support, you know, uh, reducing congestion um, as much as possible, the idea here is that when you start to look at kind of these spot improvements, you may not end up getting as much benefit as you think you do because the types of calculations you use for creating that traffic analysis um, at the intersection might show that it's working better than it really does um, when you look at it from kind of like a whole corridor standpoint and from like a travel time type of metric point of view. So these types of capacity, these minor capacity improvements tend to cost quite a bit, but they don't, they may not have as much um, benefit as you would really hope for. So what we'd like to do is push that money, it's 1.05 million towards a whole YVR corridor study. And the nice thing about this too, is that there are some other um, programs and projects going on with uh, CCTA. Uh, namely Innovate 680, which not is not just looking at 680, but is also looking at those major arterials that connect to 680. And YVR is one of them. And so if we're able to kind of set aside some money for a whole corridor study, then we might be able to leverage that could be used, that money could be used as leverage to partner with CCTA for some for implementation of some of those Innovate 680. Um, improvements, and then also with our other partners um, like Concord. So projects 45 and 46, um, these are currently in the TIF. Again, these projects are very specific. They call for some pedestrian and crossing improvements at Broadway and Arroyo and Broadway and Carlback. And it's really looking at building bulb outs at those locations. And so the North Downtown Specific Plan, which was adopted, I guess, two years ago now, um, actually calls for a road diet of Broadway between Civic and YVR. And so this is the, those two intersections, Broadway Arroyo and Broadway Carlback, are within that segment. And so rather than just paying for bulb outs um, at those two intersections, let's look at actually narrowing the entire street instead. So what we wanna do is we just wanna reallocate that money towards a Broadway road diet project instead. And then that's um, a partnership opportunity because there is an affordable housing development that is in, in the works and process um, at 699 YVR. So it's actually the corner, the Southwest corner of Ignacio Valley Road and Civic. And so there might be some monies that we can allocate through that project, um, it has some funding associated with it for active transportation if, if we win that grant funding. So it would be nice to be able to use that matching funds to really do something more than just um, a couple of bulb outs. It would be something a little more expansive. And um, actually the pedestrian benefit would be even greater because you would be reducing the crossing distance even more by implementing a road diet. So new projects, um, this is from Rethinking Mobility, really just trying to implement one of the strategies looking at bicycle um, amenities, which we're, look, we're talking about infrastructure here. So long-term parking for biking or for bikes and short-term parking for bikes, and then some other amenity infrastructure. So just $100,000 towards uh, bicycle amenities. And this would be implemented again citywide. And then additionally, there was another strategy that came from the Ruthenia Mobility Plan um, that called for improved wayfinding signage, and that's for pedestrians and cyclists, um, especially coming from BART, um, but really just for any of the activity centers and in and around the downtown. Um, and then also some additional signage for improved curb, man curb management. So looking at enhancing the type of parking signs that we use maybe in the downtown so it's a little more clear um, for how how the curb can be used especially with all the new types of uses we have currently through COVID um, 
you know, drop off pickup and um, quick curbside pickup has become more important. So there's developing changes in use of the curb. It's not just metered parking. So this would uh, be allocated towards, uh, it would allocate $100,000 towards uh, new signage for, for these two items. Another new project is the school area active transportation and traffic calming. Um, this would, this again is implementing one of the strategies from Rethinking Mobility, really again focus on infrastructure improvements. And then this is also just, um, it's in response to common citizen request. Um, our, our resident who did comment earlier, for example, was discussing, you know, a school zone and speeding in that area. And so this money could be used for um, implementing traffic calming improvements that also help with um, being with safe routes to school and being able to walk or bike to school. Um, and they're kind of, it, it can work together um, and that would help address that. So uh, they also would be quick build type projects which Jason, which Jason had uh, mentioned earlier, but they are, those are the type of projects that are kind of low, low cost and quick to implement. Um, and so we're able to stretch uh, the $250,000 that we're looking to, to allocate um, a lot further for, for more locations than just a single corner with one bulb out, for example. And then the next one is citywide traffic calming. Um, this is, is really in direct response to the feedback that we receive from the Neighborhood Streets program. Again, um, going off of what Jason had presented on, but how can we actually implement some engineering or some design improvements some physical improvements uh, for to, to calm traffic and reduce speeds on um, neighborhood streets. And again, these would be quick build type projects because we're looking at uh, $250,000 uh, towards towards the citywide traffic calming. And then the last one here is Sierra Drive Walker Avenue sidewalk additional funds. Um, we had funding available through Measure J, and uh, those city the those funds were lost uh, due to COVID um, financial impacts or budget impacts. So it's an existing capital project. It's already in design. It's well into design, and so we're looking to just allocate ninety eight thousand dollars of TIF monies to just complete that project and get that finished up. So the financial impact here, the total cost is $2.098 million, of which $648,000 is, is, is the new projects. And then really the rest is just reallocated existing projects that are already included in that TIF project list, but have been kind of rebranded. And that's 1.45 million. So my requested action here is to recommend to the city council the adoption of the proposed modifications and additions to the TIF project list. And I am available for any questions and comments. Thanks, Smyrna. Does anybody have questions? Jamie? What is, is there like any sort of um, time frame for when these projects would need to take place within? No, so with the, with the TIF money, it's really just saying, okay, yeah, we do wanna set aside this much money. Um, when Carlton Thompson, uh, he's our senior civil engineer for, for CIP, he's gonna come back in January, but at that point, that's when we allocate the funds to actually get used on that project itself. So once, so if there's a timeline that we're really looking for that we'd like to use that money, um, that's when you'd establish that that time period. But there's it doesn't expire in any kind of way. Okay. And then in terms of the 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 bike amenities, does that? Um, Maybe, and maybe it's at a higher level where it doesn't get into these types of specifics, but would that include any specific infrastructure for e-bikes? It, it could. Um, I think that the Rethinking Mobility Plan really called out for kind of more of the like bike repair stations. Um, 
but that's, that's a really interesting idea. So if that's something that you'd like to see, um, the, that money used for, we could, we could look into that, but I will, I'll caution that a hundred thousand dollars probably won't, won't get you close to the type of, um, infrastructure needed for, for like charging e-bikes, but that's really, that's really interesting. And I'll bring that up to Carlton too. Danny? Hi, um, I understand that with the shifting the money from the turn lane to doing a study about Ignacio, that's a better use of the funds, but must that 1.05 million go to some sort of facility on Ignacio or study of Ignacio, or could that be shifted to elsewhere in the city? So we could, we could just leave those projects on there and just never do them. Um, my suggestion though, really, you know, if we look at Ignacio, the idea is it's supposed to be kind of like a smart and safe multimodal corridor type study. So, you know, in implementing intelligent transportation system improvements, that's supposed to help with congestion, but then what kind of transit improvements can we, can we implement and um, looking at pet and bike. So it's really supposed to be kind of an all encompassing corridor type study. Um, that's really, and of course with traffic safety as like the, the top, top reason, but we could just, we could leave it alone and not allocate funds. But, um, I actually think that when we came to transportation commission, this may have been a year ago, originally we were going to do, I think we were going to do a two year fiscal year, um, update for the capital budget and Carlton had come in with, um, some updates and, um, another engineer on staff, but. Uh, I don't think it, it never got went through because we had changed our budget years. And part of that was we included an Ignacio Valley road corridor study um, because it is, it's a, it's a huge pain point um, for multiple reasons. Um, and it's a huge connector for the whole city. So the answer is yes, we could just not do that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could give um, just some examples of some quick built projects, both for the citywide traffic calming and then also the school area. Um, when I hear quick built, sometimes I think almost temporary, but I just want to clarify um, that. And um, would any of our projects um, incorporate art of any kind, public art? Um, just curious about that. Definitely. So quick build, it's not really intended to be temporary. It's supposed to be a stopgap of sorts. That doesn't mean that when you put something in, it doesn't have to stay there for a very long time. It's just a question of when you're able to allocate funds that would be able to really cover the full, full cost of that full build out. Um, you know, the types of materials that you can use, they do vary. Some of the easy, really easy, super, super low cost and aesthetically not so pleasing includes, you know, like the white posts that we have in downtown, for example, but they are effective, but they, you know, they can tend to get trashed. There's other materials that you can use that have a more finished look, um, but there, it's still quick build, which is really, again, intended to be that super low cost. It's mostly what they say is paint and plastic. Um, but again, it can be a little more than that. But even so, you know, the type of implementation you would, you would get in there short term, it would probably be more of like a five year timeline rather than one year. So it's not, it's not intended to be a, let's try this out. It's supposed to be a hey, we actually really want to make this improvement and we're just waiting for money, like a good money opportunity to fully build this out. And then as it relates to public art, yeah, we'd love to see some public art get implemented um, as part of, part of those quick build projects. Um, I know Oakland has been doing that, DC. There's tons of cities um, that have been implementing it. There's certain constraints for where you can paint certain colors and that kind of thing. But I think a lot of times what, what ends up happening is you have bulb outs that are painted and you could do something really fun and engage the community that way. And so we would definitely um, talk to our arts um, staff and arts commission to get them involved in, in that. Absolutely. Hey, Jared, you had a question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> two questions. 
So you talk a lot tonight between all three presentations and to follow up on what Samantha was just asking, what are some of those traffic calming measures you could put on some of these neighborhood streets in particular, um, I guess short and long term uh, to slow that speed limit down? You talked earlier about like changing the path, right? It, to, to drive the car slower versus, you know, just you can't just put the speed limit sign up and hope they go slower. Yeah, so, you know, we have a whole, traffic engineers have this whole slew, it's a whole toolbox of different traffic calming uh, tools that you can implement. And I really should put together a presentation to bring to you all um, on that. But some, some examples and the traditional examples include speed undulations, speed humps, sometimes they're called speed bumps. Um, that could be an option. Again, we're talking about certain constraints, some streets they're not, they're really not appropriate for. Um, and there are other certain, you know, secondary effects with that. But that's the classic, I think, that we always hear about. Um, some other options are more horizontal elements rather than vertical. And so when you look at those horizontal elements, it's, you know, narrowing the lanes down, um, using things called chicanes, which force you to kind of divert around and slow down um, as you're proceeding. So you're not just, you don't have just a straightaway and can go fast. Um, other things like putting in, again, narrowing down the lanes or increasing activity by allowing parking along the street, um, that can help slow things down because there's a lot of movement going on. You think about the downtown, people are pulling into and out of spaces, so you have to be a little more cautious when you're driving. Um, and then again, so other elements, but that are horizontal and vertical, those are physical ones. And then you have the enforcement type, which are your speed display signs that we do have around the city as well. But um, those physical improvements really are either something vertical that you have to drive over or something horizontal that you have to kind of drive around. Okay, Great. thanks. And yes, I would love a presentation since uh, you offered it at a 2021 meeting, no rush. <laughs> uh, that would be great. And then my other question was, you talked about uh, 100,000 for wayfinding. What kind of wayfinding are you putting in? And then the follow-up question to that is, have you examined digital interactive um, or offsetting fees with advertising revenue and stuff? I will defer the second part of your question probably to Andy. I think he could answer that better than I could. Um, we are exploring digital options for the parking guidance system. You know, we have those on-street parking sensors. We brought that to you before uh, just with information on that. And we'd like to have something interactive that's kind of on, on mobile, on your own mobile device. Um, that's certainly an option. Um, it's, that's an interesting idea for doing some wayfinding via a uh, mobile device for, for pedestrians and cyclists. That could be helpful, but definitely if you have additional information, that would be, you could send that over. Um, but generally speaking for wayfinding, especially for peds and bikes, um, they are like more human level. So um, the, the signage would be really helpful, especially for visitors um, of, of the city. And I can uh, answer the second part of that question with regard to uh, you know offsetting costs through uh, selling advertising space. Essentially, that's actually something that we've uh, discussed um, over the years with regard to bus shelters. And thus far, the city council has, as a matter of policy, uh, gone, uh, chosen not to uh, have the city explore those uh, as an option. Okay, a finance question. Um, I understand the TIP is not general fund. It's been my experience in the past when you get funding from the outside for projects, you don't allow to change them or to move them forward. You know, are you concerned that any new, you know, moving the projects, any general will get the funding will be lost? No, not for not for the TIF. Um, we have control over that project list um, and. Yeah, it is a totally separate fund than general fund. So when we when we establish that capital, the 
capital budget, those that project list, then we'll be moving the TIF money specifically in there to help. Um, to yeah, I, only have, I think you know, grant funded projects like that are going to shrink in the next couple of years because government's going to be small in the next couple of years. Definitely. And I think where the grant funding might become an, an issue again is when we look at the CIP and the capital projects. Um, the one that I was specifically talking about for Broadway, like Broadway Road Diet, is something that we know is happening very, like this is a very short timeline. Um, it's a grant application that's going in in the next two months type of thing. So um, yes, it's definitely hard with grant funding to find something that one, we qualify for, two, that we win, and three, that, you know, uh, is actually available. But I think this is actually one of those opportunities that that would work out. And then, you know, with that Ignacio Valley Road study, that's not really necessarily leaning on grant funding. It's more relying on other partners, other cities, um, that kind of thing. And Mr. Chair, I can provide a little additional uh, clarity with regard to the first part of your question about moving, uh, you know, essentially having the limited use of these funds. Um, so the traffic impact uh, or the, the TIF fee is a development impact fee charged against new development. And as such, it falls under the provisions of the uh, Mitigation uh, Fee Act, which is a state law. Um, uh, that project specific. Excuse me? That project specific. Correct. We, yeah, we 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 can move the, you know, change the items on the list as long as they're still meeting the general intent of the fee, but we can't say raid the TIF fund to build a soccer field somewhere. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Take my thoughts, so. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? Please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you are headed by audio only. If you would like to provide a comment, at this time, I will ask the secretary if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we actually have uh, two uh, people who are requesting to comment. The first is Iris, uh, it's either Gibus or Gibus, I believe. I hope I'm not mispronouncing that. And they are being brought in uh, right now. Uh, oh, they're connecting. There we go. Iris? Oh, they just muted themselves. Unmute. There we go. Okay. So my question is for uh, Smarta. Hi, Smarta. I know we're meeting in December with the Homestead Group. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. So my question is for um, Smarta. Hi, Smarta. I know we're meeting in December with the Homestead Group. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So hi. Hi. So my question is: um, You mentioned a left turn extension off of Ignacio uh, on Homestead and Walnut. Hi. So my question is: um, You mentioned a left turn extension off of Ignacio. Can you turn that off? Uh, on Homestead and Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a little better. Sorry, there was a bit of an echo. So did you want, so you were just asking about what that project was? Sorry, there was a bit of an echo. Okay. I'm trying to, let's see. M Mr. Chair, if I may uh, ask, since this is a public comment period with a two minute time limit, uh, we may wish to ask the speaker to, uh, you know, ask everything, provide all the comments, and then you can uh, refer those questions to staff to provide answers. Please do. So you may wish to ask the speaker if, if they have any additional comments or questions. Well, uh, okay. Um, what was her name? Uh, it's Iris. It's either Gibus or Gibus. I Okay. Iris, we're having a little problem with the sound. Could you ask all of your questions at once? Iris, are you there? 
They appear, appears to have. Uh, I only okay. I only have one question. <laughs> I am. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Continue. <laughs> okay. So my question is. What what's the objective? What's the objective of the left turn lane? Okay, so my question is what what's the objective? What's the objective of the left turn lane? Okay, so my question is Iris, you have two computers running once. I I I if I may uh Mr. Chair, I think uh she's asking what is the intent of the left turn lane? And if you would like to have uh, staff, specifically Smadar, uh, answer that question, I think she's ready for that. Is that okay, Mr. Chair? Yes. Great. Okay, so the intent of that left turn lane extension is to provide more space for vehicles to be able to queue up and, and turn left um, from, from Ignacio onto Walnut Boulevard. And it is the westbound approach so that's the um as you're going towards downtown so that's what the intent of that project was which was developed back in 2013 or 2014 or so and uh mr chair we have uh one more uh person wishing to speak please proceed Mr. Chair, are you there? Not my, I'm having a technical problem with that. That's fine. There we go. We do have one more uh, speaker requesting uh, to comment, uh, Ann uh, Jeminjani. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing and I do apologize for that. And we are uh, in the process of bringing her in. Okay, and uh, looks like we need to, she needs to unmute her can microphone. You? There we go. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners and staff. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on uh, uh, the the last caller's question, Iris's questions about the tip funds and I wanted to ask if it would be possible to reallocate those funds, the TIF funds uh, associated with the Homestead um, left turn lane, if we could possibly retain some or all of it um, for our traffic calming that might be needed um, on Homestead. For example, possible signage, permanent signage, or crosswalks, or uh, uh, speed bumps, that kind of a thing. So I'm just asking for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, does the, any of the commissioners have any further questions? Danny. Hi. Um so not a question of more of a statement, but just that the 250K for active transportation for schools, I think that's very wonderful and uh, maybe long overdue. So thank you for including that as a new use of the funds. Um, I would like to remind staff that there are schools that are out of Walnut Creek. For example, Mount Diablo School District has a number of schools in Pleasant Hill, but um, students' trips emanate from Walnut Creek. so just to consider that when we're looking at schools, not just to look at the schools that are in Walnut Creek, but the student population that's in Walnut Creek and where they're traveling to. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks a lot, Smarter. You don't need any action from the commission for this one. Actually, we are looking for a recommendation from this commission to the city council for them to uh, uh, make the change. Okay. Uh, should we roll call vote? 
we would first be looking for a motion. You may request uh, if there's any comments from the commission and then I'll a, a, motion. a motion to approve it as it is. Second. Chair seconds. I will go ahead and take the uh, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Cago. Aye. I'm sorry. Aye. Aye. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Ash. Yep. Commissioner Salcido. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Milks. Aye. And Chair German. Approve. The ayes have it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smarter. Item number six is a commission and staff brief that announces our brief reports on their activities. Uh, none? If you'd like, I can start and maybe that'll get the uh, creative juices flowing from <laughs> the other commissioners. <clears throat> um, I did provide you with uh, I, much of this already actually in an email uh, individually about a couple of weeks ago, but I just wanted to uh, again state but publicly that the uh, city council, this may have been last month, COVID has completely taken away my sense of time, I'll have to admit, but uh, they uh, adopted Rethinking Mobility. Uh, you'll remember uh, Ozzy Arce was heading that up and uh, uh, the, the this commission spent quite a bit of time working on that. So that uh, the transportation strategic plan uh, has been adopted and we'll be moving now into the implementation phase. Uh, so you will be certainly hearing from Ozzy in the coming year as uh, looking to actually implement that plan uh, rather than just say, put it on a shelf. We're not gonna do that. We're, we'll be uh, going forward with implementation. Other than that, I have uh, nothing else to report tonight. Has Ozzy awarded a contract for uh, scooters and um, you know, the scooter, you know, handheld scooters? You know uh, so that with regard to the shared micro mobility plan or uh, uh, pilot number two, I suppose, um, work on that has paused uh, for a number of reasons, really both uh, all COVID related. Um, for one, uh, there's been a matter of actually just reallocation of staff resources. We've had to spend quite a bit of time on uh, other matters that are related to COVID, uh, the rebound program being uh, key on that list. Um, also, as you probably uh, have all noticed, uh, of course, the transportation is a little bit different now than it was uh, nine months ago. And the, uh, the, the shared micro mobility as an example where it, uh, one area where it can possibly really shine is first and last mile connections to transit. The thing is, is nobody's really riding transit now or very few people are uh, riding transit at the moment. Uh, we're really in a, still in a moment of flux. And so uh, we'll probably be making more progress on that front as we get start returning to normal or whatever normal may wind up being. Uh, but for the moment, it's uh, on pause. Has all of BART's problems during the pandemic had any effect on the construction of the Transit Village at Walnut Creek? Uh, no, the Transit Village, uh, it's a mixed use development, uh, three phases totaling 596 units residential units, and I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, phase one, which was the garage, is completed. Phase two is under construction at the moment. And uh, the BART ridership, uh, it's a private development. And so the BART ridership and revenues related there too have not impacted the uh, construction of the, uh, uh, the Transit Village project. Okay. Did we, Andy, have you heard or are, have you guys heard anything about the impacts of transit trends and long term? Uh, has there been any reports from any, not necessarily the city, but any agencies where we're connected um, in the Bay Area? Just kind of curious. Like, I don't expect that one day we're going to flick a switch and everybody's going to all of a sudden take BART into Oakland and San Francisco again. Um, in, in terms of like project ridership projections, is that or yes, and highway usage and BART and you know just all around. I'm just curious to know if you've read anything with trends that maybe you could share later with us. Um, I have not. Uh, it's something we can certainly look into, and I, I'll, I'll let Smadar uh, interrupt me if, uh, if there's anything that she's aware of that I'm not, but I, I'm not aware of any actual formal studies uh, speaking to uh, uh, 
forgetting the word already. It's been a long week. I apologize. Um, uh, projections for <laughs> ridership returning. Um, I think just speaking in, you know, informally with, uh, say, County Connection and BART staff, um, you know, I don't think they're expecting things to really come back until a vaccine is uh, widespread uh, in use and uh, the fear of COVID uh, related, you know, resulting from that has uh, uh, dissipated. Um, also kind of an unknown is a lot of people are obviously working from home and uh, we'll see, you know, will, will that continue in some fashion um, or will everybody just start going back to their uh, physical offices and riding transit? It's a little bit unknown. And, and unfortunately, uh, as you probably have read in the news, the uh, you know the transit agencies are really hurting for money, um, and uh, without any additional federal stimulus, um, they are all looking to begin uh, cutbacks if they haven't yet already. And in fact, County Connection has uh, recently uh, started doing some outreach for some town halls, for example, to take public input as to where cuts should be made because cuts will have to be made, uh, and that's just with regard to, of course, our local bus service. Um, Bart has uh, been doing similar things. Thanks. Any other questions? That's that's all from staff. Okay. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Oh, not, it's not all from staff. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, just a super quick update. Uh, you'll probably have seen there's some new green paint on this on a few streets uh, in Walnut Creek. Um, the striping or the, the paint job is not quite done yet. Um, it did get delayed. They were supposed to finish, the contractor was supposed to finish this week, um, but that did get delayed because of the rain. Uh, we're, I think we're expecting them next week to finish up, um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And that includes a new type of crossing that we have, that we're striping in, and that's at the Bancroft uh, Contra Costa Canal Trail intersection. So Kind of, it's not a super, super new, fresh idea. Um, generally in the Bay Area, there are other locations that have kind of similar striping um, along, let's say, the Bay Trail. Uh, but it is new for Walnut Creek. So trying to make sure that people or that drivers understand it is a trail crossing so they can expect bicycles and pedestrians who are crossing there. So trying that out for the first time. Um, and then there's also some additional uh, repaving work that is in progress and it's almost completed on Broadway and Parkside. Just wanted to give you a little heads up on that too. Smart art, you, might, you reminded me, I wanted to ask, what's, what's happened to our bicycle project by the main library? Yeah, that project is kind of indefinitely on hold for right now. Um, We've implemented a half street closure already on, on Lincoln with this rebound program, which is kind of a, it's, it's really good in that we're testing the waters for part of what that plan had called for, which was a shared street on that little segment of Lincoln between Maine and Broadway. So this is kind of an interesting implementation, um, but there's, because the, the type of work that needed to get done was a full design plus um, additional outreach and more traffic volumes getting collected. And because of the rebound program and COVID, now is not a, an appropriate time to collect data necessarily for, for this use case. So we're kind of just holding off on the next, the next phase of this, um, unfortunately. But what I will say is that with this rebound program, we've been able to learn a lot about the downtown and, and how it's being used. So I think a lot of the lessons learned could be applicable for, for that. And um, one other note is that we are trying to prioritize some more east-west connections for bicycles, even if it's not Lincoln Avenue in particular. Um, and we do have um, a study that's in progress for um, potentially Newell Avenue, um, seeing what we can do there. And then also in the North downtown area, um, Parkside, as well as um, Arroyo and some other cross streets. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, I would. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like uh, Commissioner Cagle is raising her hand. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Smadar, I'm wondering um, if you've received any initial feedback about the, um, the Lincoln closure, um, just general feedback maybe from the public or um, impacts to traffic, um, that kind of thing. No, the businesses seem to love it. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we haven't really, the only traffic um, feedback that we've gotten really in the downtown has been from concerned citizens who are worried about vehicles speeding um, next to outdoor dining. Um, we haven't really gotten any, um, it's very possible that people feel this way, but we haven't actually gotten any negative feedback about you know, how circulation patterns have changed, but certainly there has been a, a change implemented. You know, we've got a few different street closures, but um, one of the things kind of moving forward through this winterization process um, is cleaning up our traffic control. So it's a little more, I guess, permanent feeling um, just in the, in the short term, you know, we were expecting this program to end mid October and it's now been extended through the end of January and, with the way that, um, you know, Governor Newsom has kind of rolled things back, it looks like it's probably going to extend a little longer. So we're looking um, at more longer term implementations or or at least just kind of cleaning things up so that there's a little less maintenance required um, on our end to keep moving those uh, no right turn signs back into place. <laughs> Jamie? Um, I was just curious about an update uh, regarding the parking garages and because I know that there was an update in terms of uh, turning the um, parking fees back on to the new rates that we um, approved. And I was just curious if um, people are using the garages, if they're filling up or if they're not um, I actually do not have any information on that, but I can follow up with our Olo looks like Smidar does. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, we did work with, um, with Carla Hansen on this, um, Matt Redmond, who's now on, he's on leave currently as he, his wife had a baby on Monday, Monday night, Tuesday morning. Um, yes. So we had pulled together, I mentioned this before, you know, we have those on-street parking sensors. And so we've been able to get occupancy data, including, you know, taking out the spaces. When you look at the full supply of the downtown, all the spaces that are currently occupied by outdoor dining. And so we were, we were able to pull that information together as well as the parking garage data in terms of just utilization, occupancy, kind of the peak demand. And what we were finding was very, very heavy usage. Um, and I don't say that lightly, it's like over 90, 90%. And um, when you hit that type of number, it means that you're gonna have a really tough time finding a parking space, right? Um, so we were seeing very heavy utilization of the South Locust Garage, which is the one uh, right there, just north of Mount Diablo and look at Locust. And then um, some, some usage of the Lesher Garage, and actually fairly low usage of the Broadway garage. Um, the Broadway garage is actually where city employees tend to park and we are not going to city hall or many employees are not going to city hall right now. So um, there is availability in the garages, but on street it is fully loaded. So what we're gonna see here is, you know, as we um, see more expansion of the rebound program, just again, because now we're seeing that this is actually going to be a much longer timeline than what we initially um, envisioned. Um, there's probably going to be an increase in demand for parking. And so that shift will and inevitably end up at the, at the garage. But again, based on occupancy numbers, we're already exceeding what the policy states, which is the 85% rule. Um, so, so, with that, with that said, it, it makes sense that we are um, pricing parking because that is a strategy that's used to bring your occupancy down to to the levels that you're you're aiming for. Okay. Any other questions? No. 
And I would like to call for adjournment and our next scheduled meeting will be January 21st, 2021. Okay. Hi, everyone. Night, everyone. We're all saying yes and waving. Hi. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everybody.